November 11th, Remembrance Day. Today is the day Canadians remember the brave men and women who have served and continue to serve our country during times of war, conflict, and peace. Specifically, the First and Second World Wars, the Korean War, and all conflicts since then in which members of the Canadian forces have participated to grant us and others freedom. I have not sacrificed anything for my freedom. It was given to me by those who came before me and sacrificed so much. So now it is my responsibility to never forget the service and the sacrifices of more than one and a half million Canadian soldiers, sailors, aircrew, and merchant seamen. They died so I could have the freedom to stand here and give this introduction. So I can get an education, get a job, live a free life. I am forever in their debt. I will remember the sacrifices of everyone, the doctors and nurses who tended to the wounded, the parents who watched their children fight things that they couldn't protect them from, the children who were too young to understand why their moms and dads wouldn't be home for Christmas, teenagers who were shipped off to fight before they even got a chance at adulthood, or the kids who had to grow up too soon so they could take care of their families in the middle of the war. Because they lost so much and because they gave me everything, I thank them. I will always remember. Protecting peace and freedom comes with dangers, and sadly, more than 118,000 Canadians have died in service over the years. Today, we at Medill pause to honor those who served and died in military service. Good morning, shoppers. At 11 o'clock on this 11th day of November, we'd like to invite you to share with us two minutes of silence in honor of our veterans. They fought and some died for their homeland. They fought and some died, now it's our land. Look at his little child, there's no fear in her eyes. Could he not show respect for other dads who have died? Take two minutes, would you mind? It's a pittance of time for the boys and the girls who went over. In peace may they rest, may we never forget why they died. It's a pittance of time. God forgive me for wanting to strike him. Give me strength so as not to be like him. My heart pounds in my breast. Fingers pressed to my lips, my throat wants to fall out, my tongue barely resists, but two minutes I will bide, it's a pittance of time, for the boys and the girls who went over, in peace may they rest, may we never forget why they died. It's a pittance of time. Of the heroes at home They have casualties, battles And fears of their own There's a price to be paid If you go, if you stay Freedom's fought for and won In numerous ways Take two minutes, would you mind? It's a pittance of time for the boys and the girls all over May we never forget Our young become vets At the end of the line It's a pittance of time 
It takes courage to fight in your own war. It takes courage to fight someone else's war. Our peacekeepers tell of their own living hell. They bring hope to foreign lands that hate mongers can't kill. Take two minutes, would you mind? It's a pittance of time. For the boys and the girls who go over In peacetime our best Still don battle dress And lay their lives on the line It's a pittance of time In peace may they rest Lest we forget Why they died Take a pittance of time I will now read the poem, In Flanders Fields, written by Lieutenant Colonel John McRae. In Flanders Fields the poppies blow, between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky the larks still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. One hundred years ago, an inspiring woman had a vision, a bright red poppy to honor veterans who lost their lives in the First World War and to help raise support funds to help others in the aftermath. The idea was conceived by Madame Anna Guerin of France, sparked by John McRae's poem in Flanders Fields. Anna had originally founded a charity to help rebuild war-torn regions of France after the First World War. Poppies made of fabric were sold to help her charity. She presented the concept to France's allies, including the Great War Veterans Association in Canada, which later became the Royal Canadian Legion. The idea was adopted, and the poppy symbol made its first appearance in Canada on July 6, 1921, the year of the first poppy campaign to support our veterans. To mark the symbol's 100th anniversary in 2021, the Royal Canadian Legion produced a replica of the original fabric pin. The familiar image has come to reflect the sacrifices of fallen Canadian veterans from all arms of the military and from all missions, including two world wars, Korea, Afghanistan, Bosnia, peacekeeping duties, and other assignments. Canada's Parliament entrusted the Legion with the exclusive right to use the poppy as the nation's symbol of remembrance and to safeguard its image, a pledge it honors today. 100 years later, the symbol is unmistakable. Its meaning still deep. The poppy of remembrance honors sacrifice. Poppy of Remembrance cries never again. The Poppy of Remembrance with like solace and support. Anna Gadea's vision lives on. To learn more about how the Legion helps veterans, visit legion.ca.
This next activity is to give us all a better understanding of how many Canadians were killed, wounded, or experienced PTSD during the First World War. Your teacher should have given you a colored slip of paper. It is black, red, green, or blue. Everyone, please stand up. Now I will say a color. Please sit down when you hear your color. If you have a black card, please sit down. You represent the 10% of Canadians who were killed in action. If you have a red card, please sit down. You represent the 20 percent of Canadian soldiers who were injured in battle. If you have a blue card, please sit down. You represent the 2 percent of Canadians who reported that they were suffering from PTSD. The only ones left standing should have a green slip of paper. You are the ones who survived the war. Now please sit down. Remember, these are only the reported Canadian statistics. There are many that remain unknown. Thank you everyone for participating in this activity. This was to give everyone a visual representation of how many people suffered during and after the war and that we must remember their sacrifice. Pocket-sized diaries were created for soldiers to carry with them during service in Afghanistan. They contain the inscription, future generations will know and understand only if you take the time to write your experiences down. Master Corporal Martin Rouleau served in Afghanistan in 2004, 2007, and 2009. He kept his diary during his last tour, writing about his unit's movements, as well as his feelings regarding the dangers he faced. I will now read the English translation of the French diary he kept. April 13th, 2009. Today is a somber day. Trooper Karine Blaise has died. Their vehicle rolled over an explosive device. She was my roommate. She was young, 21, I think, a nice young girl. She would pray before each mission. Unfortunately, I wasn't there, but I saw her body. I feel a little responsible because I tried to join that mission, but since I was leaving the day after, they didn't let me. I had to pack up her personal belongings. It's crazy how quickly we get attached to people in places like this. There were two others wounded, but they were evacuated to KAF. They'll be okay. It hurts that I probably won't be here for the ceremony. April 18th, 2009. We left yesterday and today, inspecting roads for bombs. We didn't find anything, and I walked for hours. Damn, it's hot. We're leaving again tomorrow to do the same thing. May 16th, 2009. I know I haven't written in a long time, but it's as if I had fallen into a really lethargic state of mind. I didn't feel anything anymore, no happiness or sorrow, like a cloud of fog was all around me. Tomorrow we leave for five to seven days into unknown territory. I hope I have the strength to write. It numbered a dozen upon my return. We're a hundred or so from the coast and from the prairies. I bet they keep coming. Add one more name from Ontario and carry me home down the highway of heroes, people up. Flags flying low, carry me softly down the highway of 
heroes, true patriot love, there was never more. Serve with distinction, no visions of glory. I serve without question, a personal gain. Seek no justification, it's not part of my story. And it offers no comfort to the ones who remain. Just carry me home, down the highway of heroes. I was called by my nation without hesitation. My answer I gave. Now I'm not wondering the things that I might have been. A no consolation to the forgotten way. So carry me home down the highway of heroes. People above. With the flags flying low, carry me softly down the highway of heroes. True patriot love, there was never more. Carry me home down the highway of heroes. People I love, with the hair down low. Carry me softly down the highway of heroes. True patriot love, there was never more. 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 The Canadian War Museum holds millions of objects in the National Collection. Each one tells a story. Let's look closely at one of the museum's most beloved objects, Teddy Rogers. Allow me to introduce you to Teddy Rogers. Standing only 12 centimeters tall, this small bear has a big story. He went to war. Eileen Rogers grew up on a farm in East Farnham, Quebec. She and her brother Howard enjoyed swimming and riding their bicycles. And Eileen loved playing with her teddy bear. When she was 10 years old, Eileen's father enlisted to serve in the First World War. And her life changed forever. It was February 1915 when Lawrence Rogers enlisted in the 5th Canadian Mounted Rifles, Quebec Regiment. While Eileen couldn't know exactly what military service would entail, she did know that her father was leaving, and that he would be in danger. But what could she do? With a heavy heart, she gave him Teddy as a token of her love. She hoped Teddy would serve as a good luck charm and keep her father safe. Lieutenant Lawrence Browning Rogers served as a stretcher bearer in the First World War, and later as a frontline medical officer. On October 30th, 1917, Lawrence was performing his duties as a medic at the Battle of Passchendaele in Belgium. A few years earlier, the land would have been farmers' fields, similar to his own farm in Quebec. 
but the war had taken its toll, and the devastated landscape of shell holes and mud must have felt very far from home. All around him, bombs exploded and machine guns rattled. But Lawrence couldn't let himself get distracted. He had a job to do, helping the wounded. The attack had started at 5.50 that morning, and by day's end, there were thousands of Canadians, wounded or dead. With Teddy in his pocket, Lawrence was tending to the wounded of his unit when disaster struck. He was killed by enemy shell fire. Teddy was found and sent back to Canada. Today, Teddy is displayed in the Canadian War Museum, where he serves as a touching reminder of the cost of war. Teddy represents the love that Eileen Rogers had for her father, Lawrence. The 650,000 Canadians who served in the First World War all had loved ones who missed them and worried about them. The 61,000 Canadians who were killed in the First World War were mourned by those left behind. While Eileen was reunited with Teddy, she would never see her father again. War is a devastating human experience, with lasting impacts on those who serve, their families, and their communities. Please be advised that the following video contains graphic and intense content. If you need to take a break, step into the hall, please do so. We were taken prisoner on December 25th, 1941, Christmas Day. The Japanese culture has little regard for prisoners of war. The, the Japanese treatment uh, of the Canadian prisoners and all their pr prisoners was savage in the extreme. I also seen them take the nurses out of Bone Road Hospital and rape them while they held machine guns on us and then slit them wide open with the bayonets. And I still have nightmares over it. I wake up just screaming. And uh, we couldn't do nothing because they had the two machine guns there and two on the other side. Like, so in case of anybody moved. Brrr. Kilfoyle had been wounded and couldn't keep up. And uh, all that the job guard did was just cut him out and uh, we continued on. And we heard Kilfoyle scream, but we just can imagine what happened. And they would bane at them right there and there. One would hit them from the front, one would hit them from the back. And uh, the guys never yelled out or anything. They just you know, grunt and went down. Then the Japanese took control and they took us into the fields. I don't know where exactly, somewhere on the island of Hong Kong. They stripped us of our clothes, the whole damn gang, and handed us G-strings. That's all we had for four long years. <laughs> We would get beaten for the stupidest reasons. We had an interpreter. They called him Slap Happy. He'd get us up in the middle of the night, the whole crew. He would skip over one of us, beat three or four, and then we'd stay there an hour, hour and a half. Afterwards, you'd go back to bed. It takes about 3,000 calories to keep a person, a hardworking person, alive. We were fed about 1,200. We all suffered from hunger. We woke up at night because we were hungry. It was just boiled rice, but it was full of um, rat dirt, uh, maggots. The sight of it made us sick. We didn't want to eat it. It was full of little white maggots like rice. And we had to eat that. Eat it or starve to death. There was no meat. Well, maybe just a taste now and then. Once there was a prisoner ravaged by an illness like diphtheria or something serious like that. He was losing his strength, his muscles and everything, and couldn't get it back. There was no protein, nothing like that. 
So a big man need, needs more. So you could see these big men, 200 pounds and up, they didn't last too long. He lost his weight so fast, he was down to under 100 pounds, that his, his hide hung right almost to his knees, like a skirt. If they wanted 500 guys to work, only 500 were fed. If you didn't work in Japan, you weren't fed. There was uh, almost no medical supplies. People died of um, uh, things like diphtheria uh, because the Japanese refused to give us any serum. And these people were lying there, just skin and bones, and that's no word of a lie. There's just skin and bones. It was terrifying there. You'd be talking to a guy one evening, and the next day he was dead, gone. We had nothing to offer them except encouragement and a pat on the back. If we had a sickness, you had to either pull through or die. I've seen guys in the huts and die right in front of me because there's pure out blood. You can't imagine the smell of the dried blood in, in, the, in the heat. It was sweet, sickening smell. It was terrible, really terrible. If you had a decent pair of boots or remnants of a uniform, you'd be called upon to carry a body maybe as many as four or five times in a day. There was guys that was six foot two, and there was little coffins about uh, five foot long. But with a bayonet in, in my back, the Japanese asked me, to saw their legs off so they would fit in there. How could I do that? I just, I just. They, they uh, didn't uh, do military burials anymore because the, the sound of the, the last post was uh, just too much. Couldn't, uh, couldn't take it. And war is a terrible thing, but slavery is a hell of a lot worse. They refused to. Uh, obey the, uh, the principles of the Geneva Convention. Well, I would say that probably Dante's Inferno would have been a picnic compared to that coal mine. You got to the top of the mine and you saw the steam rising. It was so hot. The temperature varied between 95 and 120 degrees. You worked in water up to your knees because there was water everywhere. The pump didn't work properly. Our bodies swelled up from the heat. After three months, my morale was gone. Practically all of us wanted to die. I tell you, uh, good, a good day's work. Tomorrow, instead of doing 10 cars, you do 12 cars. So we do 12 cars. As it kept going, they always wanted more. It's unbelievable how much work a human being can do when we were skinny. We were, we're skeletons walking around with skin pullovers, and we still worked like slaves. If you didn't, you died. And I said to uh, Mount Fuji, every day, you didn't get me yesterday, you so-and-so, you won't get me today either. And I think this was the attitude of most of our guys, that, you know, it, it was a will to live. So the story is about the Canadian spirit. 3,000 miles from home, with no hope, they never gave up. At this time, the Student Council President and Vice President, Amelia Fair and Emma Schmidt, are with Mrs. Steelstra at the Wingham Cenotaph, officially representing the bill by placing a wreath during the Legion ceremony. If you could please rise if you are able, remove your hats for the rouse, the moment of silence, followed by the last post.
You may now be seated. Today, we have taken time to remember those who volunteered, sacrificed, served, fought, and died for our freedom. We salute those who made the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. We will never forget. Following this assembly, classes will be participating in a follow-up hands-on activity to remember and honor our veterans. We have one more request before we end this assembly. For secondary students and staff, we ask that at 1120, as you go for lunch, you place your poppy on the black cross made by our woodworking class and located at each zone entrance. Grade seven and eight students are asked to place their poppy at the cross when they leave for recess. Thank you for your attention and respect. 